Hey, Jason, congratulations on your 1,000 podcasts. Uh, that's amazing. You, know, you are so productive. Not only that for Creative Wealth, but everything else that you do. Pretty incredible. Hope all is well. Just want to let you know I'm thinking about you and hope things are going great. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to episode 1081, 1081. Thank you so much for joining me as we have got a bonus episode today and it of course as always, a lot is going on in the world. Last day here in beautiful Kauai. It is uh, absolutely gorgeous outside. Uh, sadly, today I haven't had a chance to experience much of it. A <laughs> little nap by the pool, a little swimming in the beach, but lots of work to do. <laughs> when running these events, I really get behind on stuff. So trying to play catch up. Got a little bit of information for you that I think might be interesting. So Alan Greenspan, our former Federal Reserve Chair, the longest serving Federal Reserve Chair certainly of my lifetime, known as the maestro, and he uh, he was uh, in that position from 1987 until, oh gosh, what, about 2006, I guess, right? And, you know, he was credited, I think, um, I don't think he deserved the credit for a lot of the uh, stuff that happened under his reign. He was a uh, he was a, uh, a helicopter Federal Reserve chair, just like Ben Bernanke was. Uh, the, you know, he got the moniker Helicopter Ben because he one time said that, uh, you know, if the economy needed it, if you had to stimulate the economy, the Keynesian way, John Maynard Keynes, of course, believed in priming the pump. And he was the opposite of Hayek and a lot of the other better thinkers about the economy. I do admit that, uh, you know, that jolt of caffeine does help once in a while when the government pumps it in extraneously. But he got a lot of credit for things that really just weren't legitimate economic policy, right? They weren't good economic policy. You know, basically on a, a, a long span of quantitative easing, you know, anything's going to look good. But at the end, the ending was pretty ugly. And I think he retired at just about the right time to let someone else uh, come in and, and deal with his mess, right? And that was, of course, Ben Bernanke that did. He's out with an article, uh, and he's talking about seven threats to the booming economy, seven threats to the booming economy. And he talks about the ballooning U.S. federal budget deficit soaring. Now get this soaring inflation, right? Soaring inflation. And uh, that's something I've predicted for a long time. And uh, it was pretty tame for, for several years there, although it was higher than the official numbers would ever let on. And then falling savings rates, declining productivity, a bubble in the bond market, undercapitalized banks, and the trade war. I don't agree with all of this. I think that uh, some of it is um, rather overrated. Uh, again, I'm not a, an extreme student of the banks and whether or not they're undercapitalized. I think they've always been undercapitalized. And I think uh, banking has always been based on a house of cards and with fractional reserve banking or fractional reserve lending. It's referred to both ways. But here's what Greenspan says about a few things that I think you'll find very interesting in uh, tailoring your investment strategy to them and following, hey, none other than yours truly, Jason Hartman's plan to benefit and become extremely wealthy through what? Through inflation-induced debt destruction. Well, the article says, among the risk that worry Greenspan is the possibility of an acceleration of inflation followed by a sharp hike in interest rates by the Fed to rein it in. Now, 
remember, you know, the, the way it works, obviously, is, and I know you all pretty much get this, is that when the economy gets overheated and there are signs of inflation, the Fed tightens the money supply, we see increased interest rates, and that puts a damper on the economy. It slows it down, reigns in inflation. Of course, the most famous Federal Reserve chair that really did this, made us all take the hard medicine, was Paul Volcker, who broke the back of very serious inflation in the past from the, the you know late 70s, early 80s, that uh, misery index stagflationary time under Carter. Uh, and it did bleed over into the early 80s for sure. We saw him raise rates and tighten the money supply just incredibly, and it ultimately did break the back of inflation. And I think he gets a lot of credit for that. It's a tough thing to do, but, you know, you got to do it. And the idea that you have this central bank and a managed economy and central planning, which is a very communistic type of concept, it all really is is terrible. I mean, that's what causes these boom and bust cycles. You know, I say just let the market manage the economy rather than some central planners uh, at the Federal Reserve or at, uh, you know, the Treasury Department. And, um, you know, but it's the way it is. Look, right, it's the way it is. So I say just align our interests with the most powerful forces the human race has ever known, governments and central banks. And here Greenspan is, is saying what, what he predicts will happen. And I think as income property investors, we can all benefit from this very, very well. As he told Barron's, quote, we are working toward stagflation as characterized by a weaker economy and inflation. During the 80s, we had an obvious occurrence of that. The Federal Reserve can put a clamp on it. It lasted for two to three years and it brought it to a halt. Now that was Volcker, of course, right? But we don't think it's terribly different this time. The impetus for this bout of inflation will come from rapidly growing federal budget deficit, itself the result of rapidly rising entitlement spending, particularly on Social Security and Medicare benefits for retirees. Greenspan notes that the number of Americans aged 65 and older is increasing at twice the rate among working age Americans, creating the biggest fiscal challenge in U.S. history. Make sure you really got that. We've been talking about this on the show over the years many times. The graying of America, the graying of America concept. Now we have this time in the U.S. where there is a very large older population that is living longer and longer than ever before. Now, granted, recently because of the very sad obesity and diabetes epidemics uh, and just all of the, I mean, just watch the documentary, Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. We are being poisoned. You've heard me rant about that too many times. I won't bother today. But I got another interesting article for you about that if we have time, which we probably won't. Um, so we are definitely being poisoned. And so lifespan actually now is starting to decline just a bit. Isn't that a terrible thing? It really is. It should be the complete opposite at this time in history with all of the advances in medical technology, of course. So we've got this graying of America trend. Certainly Americans are living longer than they did when the Social Security program was designed, when the average age in retirement was something like three and a half years or something, right? Now, you know, people live 20, 30 years past retirement, and this is very expensive. This is a, uh, a hugely lopsided population curve similar to that of, do you know what country I'm going to say? Do you know? Yes, you do, because you listen to the show and you are a high information investor. <laughs> Japan. Japan, very similar, but their numbers are skewed much more radically than ours. And the U.S. is much, much better off than Japan. But the concept is similar because they have this aging, graying population. Uh, the Japanese aren't having kids. They're going extinct. And Japan will basically not exist in you know, something like 70 years. I mean, you can't, look, as Mark Stein says, you can't have a country without people. You can't have a country without people. So Japan, Russia, Western Europe, this is just true all over the West, right? It's uh, mind boggling, really, what's going on demographically in the world. He says stagflation is coming. Now, what does that mean to us as investors? Well, it means we will benefit very handsomely or beautifully uh, from inflation-induced debt destruction. 
talked about it many times. You understand the concept by now, uh, my trademark term, and that will benefit us as investors. But it also means that if he's right, that we have this weaker economy in the future and inflation at the same time, the worst of both worlds. Usually, you know, if you have inflation, it's the result of too many dollars chasing a limited supply of goods and services, a strong economy, right? But when you have the misery index, the Carter concept of the late 70s, stagflationary times, it's, it's miserable because the economy is weak and you have inflation at the same time. That's rare that that happens that way. It's not fun, but it's going to be a lot more fun for us than it will be for most of the population, sadly. And remember, for better or worse, love it or hate it, economics is a relative concept, okay? Look, it's all relative to what everybody else has. You know, you can all talk nice about, hey, there's enough pie to go around, etc. And certainly capitalism does make that happen better than any other system. And it does increase the size of the pie. The size of the pie is increased in the freest market, no question about it. But in stagflationary times, your tenants are suffering more. Now, what does that mean? What will they want? Well, they'll want economical housing. They will accept less than they otherwise would have expected in the past. So, you know, when you look at two ladders side by side, and we'll call them the socioeconomic ladders, right? You place these two ladders side by side, and in the past, if you had a tenant who was, say, age 35, and that tenant would have a standard of living that represented some rung on that socioeconomic ladder. And then, as you move into these stagflationary times, that rung on the ladder is lower. So they might have had a 2,000 square foot home in a nicer neighborhood during a stagflationary time, they'll have to live in a, a 1,300 square foot home in a lesser neighborhood. And that's just kind of the way it goes during stagflation. It's the way it goes. So no matter what happens, if you've positioned your housing investments correctly, and that's why I have a little bit of a concern. By the way, can you hear the horn blowing there at sea in the background here in, in Kauai at the Grand Hyatt? <laughs> Adds to the atmosphere of the podcast, doesn't it? I hope so. Anyway, when you have this happen, you know, people just expect less. They just have to accept less. That's just the way it is. And we can catch people moving up the socioeconomic ladder or moving down the socioeconomic ladder. And if we position our rental property investments in the right segment, we can catch them either way and we can serve them either way because we can provide rental housing to them on uh, whether they're on the way up or on the way down. They might have had a bigger house in the past. They might have had a house that uh, went into foreclosure like we saw so, you know, so many millions of people either by choice or by default, <laughs> pardon the pun, go into foreclosure during the Great Recession. But this time around, it would be, according to Greenspan's prediction, and hey, he knows he does know something about the economy, whether or not I agree with his philosophy, which I don't. By the way, it's interesting. Do you know Greenspan was really good friends with the author Ayn Rand, the famous author that wrote Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead? Atlas Shrugged, by the way, one of the best books of all time. You must read it. Whenever you have time to sit down and digest 1,200 pages, go for it. It's incredible. It's life-changing. For those of you who have read Atlas Shrugged, who is John Galt? Who is John Galt? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but he and Ayn Rand were very good friends back in New York City years ago, maybe in the 60s, I don't know. They were very good friends, and Ayn Rand would have completely, she was probably rolling over in her grave watching Alan Greenspan do what he did as Federal Reserve Chair because he just became a sellout, sadly. But anyway, it is what it is. Align our interests with the most powerful forces. That's what we need to do. Now, this is one of the reasons, and I kind of alluded to it a moment ago, that I have some trepidation about short-term rental properties and any higher-end property. Because remember, that's not necessity housing. If you look at this socioeconomic ladder again, right, and you've got high-end housing, middle-end housing, low-end housing, and everything in between on the ladder up and down, you can't catch people moving down when you have a high-end property, 
you're only able to serve one end of the socioeconomic ladder. But when you're at the lower middle, you can serve the biggest segment of that. And that's why still, you know, I don't tend to fall for, well, I fall for it a little bit. Hey, I'm human, (laughs) but um, I try not to fall for it. The sort of the hype and the trends and the the trendy thing out there, right? And, you know, the trendy thing lately, well, there's a lot of trendy things lately, a lot of dumb money in the market. At our Venture Alliance meeting the past two days here in, in Kauai, we talked a lot about the dumb money. And when things are booming, money gets really stupid. Don't let that happen to you. You know, if you if you have some wealth, like I said before, it's okay to speculate with 10 or 15% of it. Take some risk. You can afford to lose. And you might win. You might hit a home run. But for the rest of, of the world, you've got to invest conservatively and prudently. And put your money in the spectrum of the socioeconomic ladder where you can serve the most people, where you've got the biggest market and can serve the most people. So I mentioned the food thing earlier, and of course, most of us know we are being poisoned by our food and the big food companies. Just a little thing here, because there is a uh, Wall Street Journal article, and this is uh, last weekend's edition, November 3rd and 4th, and I thought this was interesting because I've thought this way for a long time about food. Now, I'm not much of a foodie. I just eat to live. I don't live to eat. But I do think that there is one kind of interesting thing that few people think about. And in this Wall Street Journal, there's a, there's a whole article about it, which I've never seen before. I just thought of this myself many, many years ago, maybe 15 years ago or so. And it's kind of this concept. Think about it. In the olden days, when life was more traditional and the family ate around the dinner table and everybody showed up for dinner and it was kind of an event, you know, it was just something they did. Hey, like I said, watch old movies and watch old TV shows. Make sure you stay in touch with how things used to be because those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And there are so many nuances of that, right? This isn't a big historical thing, but it's just the way society was. And guess what? When people sat around the dinner table, They would be in the kitchen before dinner, and they wouldn't be preparing food in a microwave. They would prepare food the old-fashioned way, right, in, you know, pots and pans and ovens. And in so doing, the aroma of the food filled the house, right? And that was part of the taste experience. And I think nowadays, because so much of the food we eat is processed and it's just crap. It's disgusting. It really is. You know, sadly, we all probably do it. I I know I certainly eat this junk too, this poison, but I try to minimize it. And because of that, you know, we gobble it down quickly and we don't have the full food experience, which involves many senses, not just taste buds. So this article says eating should feed all of our senses. That's the title of the Wall Street Journal article. Food isn't all about taste. It's essential to smell the bay leaf and to hear the snap of the celery stick, right? So the author of this article, B. Wilson, she's uh, talking about how it's much more than just this one-dimensional thing. Hey, you know how I talk about income property? It's a multi-dimensional asset class. Well, hey, food is a multi-dimensional asset class. And I would just encourage you to keep that in mind. I think that would really help solve a lot of the health problems we have if people treated food more in a, uh, a way that involved multi-dimensional senses, if you will. So kind of likened it to real estate investing, didn't I? Hey, that wasn't bad. (laughs) Okay, next week, we have got to talk about retiring at age 40. Why the heck would you want to do that? But okay, (laughs) we will talk about it. Because uh, this is another interesting Wall Street Journal that I have just got to rant about. And we don't have time to rant about that today. But I'm going to rant about it next week, I think. Because uh, this just kind of blew my mind. Maybe you saw it already. And you know what I'm going to say. One of our Venture Alliance members, Mary Ellen, read that article. uh, As I talked about it just a little bit during our Venture Alliance uh, Mastermind meeting yesterday. It blew my mind profiling a lawyer who's 38 years old who wants to retire at 40 and how she's doing it. Oh my God, be careful of what you read in the mainstream media because this just, it kind of blows my mind. I'll rant about it 
in an upcoming episode. Okay, let's get to part two and make sure you go to jasonhartman.com slash contest. We're going to wrap up that contest for the Ring Doorbell or the Amazon Echo next week. We appreciate your comments and questions that you can submit when you enter the contest. Just takes, you know, a couple seconds to enter, but you can always uh, editorialize a little bit and ask us a question or tell us what you think about anything. And that's optional. Okay, let's get to part two of our guest and make sure you go to jasonhartman.com slash contest. You know, it seems, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm just being too cynical and sort of strange. I'm on one hand, I think it's an amazing time to be alive. And I say that all the time because it really is. But on the other hand, I think there are some pretty ugly things going on in the world. And one of which that it seems to impact me almost every day in business. And I, I just, I get very discouraged by it. it. There seems to be this real lack of ethics and character anymore nowadays. What's going on out there? Uh, you know, you've written about this and, and spoken about it a lot. Give us a, an overview of, of your thoughts. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, that's really something that I'm heavily focused on today. I mean, I just completed a book, In Good Faith, Questioning Religion and Atheism, where this is one of the core issues that I deal with, which is modern morality and how we get our modern morality from the Bible. And in my book, one of the things that I do is I talk about when I first came to New York, the first year I was in New York, I got a ride downtown. I lived in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and I got a ride downtown from a middle-level trader who kept explaining to me on each of these rides. Remember, this was in the days, these were in the 80s. They were before you had cell phones and and, and cars. So we had people had to talk to each other when they, when they were in cars. It was, you <laughs> yeah. know, just incredible. What a concept. Um, ancient history. Yeah. But we weren't in dinosaurs. We were still in a car. In any event, he would explain to me and sort of my cost of getting this free trip downtown from him was he would tell me his philosophy. And his philosophy was what was best for him was best. And he liked rules that were very detailed because then he could stay – as long as he stayed in the middle of the rules and didn't break any rule, he could make as much money or manipulate those rules as much as he could get away with. Mm-hmm. There was no sort of spirit to the rules. There was what was good for him. And by the way, he knew he had to manage people up. He knew he had to manage people down. He never would say and he, he was the modern-day Machiavellian in that he – wanted himself to look good, wanted to do sort of um, uh, social virtue displays. But what he really wanted to do was to figure out how he could make as much money for himself. And whatever achieved that was good. Whatever didn't achieve that was bad. And that's really an idolatry of money. Mm -hmm. It's making money your key value. And in a way, it was sort of the reason it's I called it idolatry is because I define idolatry is sort of different than I think most people think of it. Idolatry to me, and I, def- I go into more detail in, in good faith in the book, is a set of lies about power. It's ascribing supernatural or super authority to finite beings, i.e. people, ideologies, elements like money. And we thought we overcame that thousands of years ago with the God King Pharaoh. But the 20th century was all about idolatry. You know, people, tens of millions of people marched to their death in China because Mao told them to. Mm -hmm. And Stalin sent tens of millions of people to the gulag. And why did they do it? Because they ascribed an authority or an idolatry to someone. And let me bring this home in a small, I don't want to call it a small way, but how we overlook that moral mistake of sliding into idolatry every day. The movement currently... Um, in reaction that started with uh, the revelations about Harvey Weinstein. Mm -hmm. Why did people give themselves over to Harvey Weinstein and think that they had to do whatever he did, whether it was in whatever manipulative way he imagined? Right, because they they ascribed an authority to him, right? He was an idol. So you couldn't topple, just like you couldn't topple the God King Pharaoh, Mm -hmm. you couldn't topple Harvey Weinstein. He could make or break your career. And he did that largely to women, it looks like, but to some men too, Mm -hmm. where they had to literally do unnatural things because we believed as a society 
his lies about power. And no one called him out. And look, the Bible is all about speaking truth to power and, you know, the prophets who spoke back to kings and the like. And, and that's what we're so sorely missing in today's day and age. And like you, I really look at what goes on and I, you know, I want to cry sometimes from pedophile priests to red-handed rabbis to inflammatory imams. Mm -hmm. I mean, it happens everywhere. It's happening in the business world and it's happened sadly in the religious world. And that's what my book is really all about, is trying to reclaim and re-identify important values, understand what idolatry is, and put that out there. And I think once you do that, People feel enabled and, uh, you know, ennobled to some degree to, to step up and to stand up. So how do we fix this? Well, I think the first place we fix this is by re-embracing the golden rule, which is, I think, something that both religiously inclined folks and atheists can do, which is in our policy, you know, like every other bank, we have to have a policy of corporate standards. And, you know, it just got to be like other banks. I saw it was getting bigger and bigger. And so I added a line at the beginning, which frankly, for most policies, I think you could, I think you would waste tens of thousands of pages of bank regulation. If you just put in, don't do unto your client what you wouldn't want them to do to you. <laughs> Good luck with that one. <laughs> well, I think okay, yeah. <laughs> that you replaced tens of thousands of uh, bank regulations from the FDIC to everybody, yeah, well, to the Fed. That's not, that's not just true in banking. It's true of really any law. I mean, you could get rid of law after law after law if you just had the golden rule. I mean, hey, that's why it's the golden rule. It makes sense. It works, right? <laughs> it does, but then you don't have people like that trader I was talking about who was happy if there were very detailed rules, because then all he had to do was figure out how to get around those right, rules. Right, exactly. That's such a good point, you know. And this is what the central planners in government never realized, too. You know, you could look at this another way, is that they don't realize that the market reacts to things. And so every time there's a new law, a new tax law, a new minimum wage law, whatever, you know, everybody finds a way to get around it. You know, a good example that's sort of easy to understand is Obamacare, right? So Obamacare comes out and suddenly every 40 hour a week or full time employee becomes a 30 or 32 hour a week part time employee. You know, all these companies react to it. That's the way it works. So if you just had the golden rule, how simple it would be, right? It would be very simple. And and I think that the other thing that we need to think about is, you know, as we're entering an era, you you, you touched on Google briefly and, and the like. But I think as we enter an era where more and more decisions are made by machines um, in all sorts of ways, I think putting morality and reason back in the center, it's going to be more and more and more crucial to society. I think it's very easy for technologies to be very, very discriminatory. I worry about AI when it comes to credit decisioning, mm -hmm. because even if you and I, I talk about this in the book, even if you it's in section one of the book, even if you tell your AI and don't allow it to know whether a person is black or brown or green or yellow or pink or whatever, the AI is definitionally very, very, very smart. And it's going to figure out all sorts of groupings of people who may have similar characteristics. That's what the so-called fat pipe social algorithms do. And so you'll end up discriminating against people who there's really no reason to discriminate against them other than the networks that they have, their families, their other, their friends. And we could end up consigning certain groups of people to always be at the bottom of the economic totem pole, to always pay the highest rate on credit cards, to always have the most difficulty getting mortgages. Why? Because we could say, and financial institutions might say, well, we didn't do that. We didn't discriminate that. That's what the AI system told us. Mm -hmm. And I worry that we, that just like I spoke about idolatry in other ways, we could make AI decisioning. We could, just like Harvey Weinstein, we could impute to it a sort of super authority that's untoppable. Well, we have to trust our AI mm -hmm. because it's making the right decisions. Right. Well, that's why it's more and more important. It's as important as ever that we call out idolatry for what it is. We recognize 
what institutions and what ideologies and what technologies we're bowing down to, and that we fix that through, you know, again, I think a good first proxy is the golden rule. Mm -hmm. So these are the things, the reason that I think that as someone who is a believer, that we can't say, oh, belief is on one side and business is on the other. Because where the rubber meets the road is, and Adam Smith recognized that, and the Bible recognized that just as well. I mean, if you can only read one chapter of the Bible, read chapter 19. Everything that we do economically, God is a witness. What's chapter 19? Chapter 19 in Leviticus. I'm okay. sorry, chapter 19 in okay. Leviticus, which is in a way it says, don't cheat, don't lie, don't steal. Every time it says that, because I am the Lord your God. In other words, just like Adam Smith had an invisible hand mm -hmm. witnessing every transaction, the Bible says whenever you do a transaction, there are three parties. There's you, your counterparty, and God watching to see what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, having that sense of morality is going to be more and more important when a lot of decisions are semi-invisible. Right. And you know what? I'm glad you mentioned that. And maybe we'll wrap up with this. But there are um, people who believe that you can just have this atheistic world and uh, have the government hold people accountable for their wrong deeds and, and such. And, you know, people just like you gave the example of the Wall Street trader, or anybody in any circumstance, everybody knows that they can get away with stuff. The government, even though Big Brother is watching, can't watch everything and certainly can't prosecute everything, right? When people have no higher authority than government, that is just a recipe for disaster, if, in my opinion. You've got to have people live in, you know, and I'll just say it, some degree of fear, maybe that's not the most uh, eloquent choice of words, that they will have consequences for their actions. Do you agree with that? Well, look, I'd like to stick with the carrot instead of the stick. Right. <laughs> I think if people have faith, I think if people have faith and recognize that every other person on this planet has some sort of divine spark, mm -hmm. or if they don't believe that, at least believes that we share an important part of humanity with everybody else, and therefore we have a duty, and those values are taught from an early age, I think that we have a good shot. Now, don't get me wrong. You need to be able to punish people yeah. who do wrong. They need to have punishment if they do something terribly wrong. But I'd like to start on the good side. Whatever it is. But I'm saying, yeah. you know, no higher accountability than the government, right? You know, I think that's why you need God in society. That's my point. I agree. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. I think even government shouldn't be all powerful. You know, I mean, that's why we have divided government, to something that, frankly, we've gotten from the Bible, too where there shouldn't even be one part of government that is all powerful. I mean, in the Bible, you had the high priest, you had the king, you had the Sanhedrin, the judicial department, and you had the prophet whose job was always to speak truth to power. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want any part, you don't even want government to be all powerful. Right. You want nothing to be all powerful exactly, in the end. Exactly, exactly. Scott, give out your website and tell people where they can find out more. I'd love people to go to my website, which is ingoodfaith.com. There you can learn more about the book. You can learn more about what I'm saying and get some links to that TED Talk and to uh, some of my articles. And if you'd like, and hopefully you will, please, please order the book. Fantastic. Scott Shea, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jason. A pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go Go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. 